everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to go over hyperkalemia. In my previous video I went over hypokalemia so be sure to check that video out so you can refresh your knowledge on that. But in this video what I want to do is I am going to give you an overview of the things that you're going to need to know for your lecture exams and for the NCLEX. I want to hit the high points to make sure you understand it. And then after this video I highly recommend you go to my website registerednursern.com and take the quiz that goes along with this lecture. It's going to quiz you on hyperkalemia and hypokalemia and make sure you know the difference and you may see some of those questions on your lecture exam. Um, you can get that link in the description below or a card will be popping up so you can have access to that. So let's get started. First, let's talk about hyperkalemia. Okay, what I like to do whenever I have these big words like that, I like to break them apart because you have a lot of hyper and hypo conditions and you need to know exactly what you're dealing with. So let's break it apart. You have hyper, hyper means excess, high. You have cal, K-A-L, which means potassium. That's the root word for potassium. And then you have emia, which means blood. So you put it all together, it means high potassium in the blood. So what is a normal potassium level? A normal potassium level is 3.5 to 5.1. Some books say 3.4 to 5.2, depends on who you're asking, but that is what I go by. And anything higher than seven is dangerous and the patient needs interventions fast. Okay, so let's talk about hyperkalemia on a cellular level to help you understand it because whenever I'm studying this stuff, that really helps me if I can see the picture of it and get a real understanding of what it is. Okay, so your cell, here's your cell and in your cell you have the organelles and it is made up of a lot of different electrolytes and then outside your cell, which is the extracellular, the inside of the cell is intracellular, and then outside is extracellular, you have your blood, and in your blood you have all these awesome little things, and we have some sodium, potassium among things. And potassium loves to live intracellular. That is its home. But it does make up the extracellular fluid. There are some in the blood. Now, whenever you're getting a blood test for potassium, so whenever a doctor orders a potassium level or an electrolyte level on a patient, they are seeing how much potassium is in the blood, not inside the cell. So that's what blood levels look at. They look at the extracellular potassium. So normally what's happened with hyperkalemia is that your potassium, which is congregated a lot in the cell, has moved outside into this extracellular fluid. So your blood test is picking up lots of potassium, which can cause us trouble. Now remember, potassium is responsible for nerve conduction and muscle contraction. And when you have too much potassium, the body starts doing some crazy things. And that's gonna help you remember what's causing it, and your signs and symptoms because it's going to be dealing with those muscles and nerves and that's why you're going to be seeing these symptoms. So first let's talk about the causes of hyperkalemia. Okay, I have thought of this phrase to help us remember it. Now remember, hyperkalemia, you have too much potassium. So remember this phrase, your body's cared too much for potassium. It loves it, so it's cared way too much for it, so it decided to keep too much of it around. And the key word is cared, C-A-R-E-D. So let's remember it through this little mnemonic acronym. Okay, C, one cause is cellular movement of potassium from the intracellular, this part right here, to extracellular. And this happens whenever a patient is burned they have any other type of tissue damage or they're experiencing acidosis. Now remember in hypokalemia, a patient can have that due to alkalosis, so it's the opposite. Okay, A for adrenal insufficiency, and this is seen in Addison's disease. Now remember in hypokalemia, you have Cushing's di um, disease with that. Okay, R for renal failure. You will see a lot of patients who get dialysis all the time. One of the top things is that their potassium levels will be crazy high and they go and get dialysis and it takes it off and they're a lot better. So renal failure. 
E for excessive potassium intake. They've consumed too much potassium or maybe their diuretic, which we'll get here to it in a second, um, has con conserved way too much potassium or maybe they've overdosed on their supplement or something like that or um, their kidneys aren't working good, so they've been keeping the potassium. And then D for drugs. Um, your potassium sparing drugs will keep that, and you need to remember those. These are test questions. You'll be given a scenario, and you'll need to know drugs that are potassium wasting diuretics and potassium dr sparing diuretics. And your potassium sparing diuretics are your aldacto, triamterene, are your major ones and then you also have what's called ACE inhibitors. These are cardiac medications and they will mess with your potassium levels and so will NSAIDs like ibuprofen, things like that. Okay, so those are the causes of hyperkalemia. Now let's look at the signs and symptoms. How is a patient going to present clinically to you? A great way to remember this is the word murder. Okay, remember, hyperkalemia can be dangerous. It's going to murder them, so murder. Okay, M, muscle weakness. Like we said, potassium is big with your muscles and your nerve conduction, so you're going to have muscle weakness. It's not going to work right. You, urine production will be low or probably absent because they're in renal failure. Patients who have renal failure, they don't urinate, so not going to have good urinary output. Respiratory failure, R for respiratory failure. And this is because whenever you breathe, we use our accessory muscles. Those aren't going to be working very well. Patients in alkalosis too, I mean acidosis too. And you can also have seizures with this, so that's gonna cause respiratory failure. D for decreased cardiac contractibility. Um, this, the patient will have a decreased pulse. Their pulse will be weak whenever you feel it. And they'll have a low blood pressure. E for early signs of muscle twitching and cramps. Again, that goes back to potassium's role in your muscle conduction. So you'll have that. And a late sign, meaning this isn't good, they will have profound weakness, literally just can't move. It's almost like they're paralyzed or flaccid. And then R, last part, is rhythm changes. And this is another thing you definitely need to pay attention to. I'm gonna show you what a normal EKG looks like, and then I'm gonna show you another EKG with hyperkalemia. But let's talk about what you can see. Okay, what will you see rhythm change? You will see tall peaked T waves. You will see flat P waves, or they may be absent, may not even be there at all. And you can see wide QRS complexes a pro or a prolonged PR interval. And then this will advance to cardiac arrest like V-fib, VTAC, anything like that. So let's take a look at what a normal EKG looks like and then compare it to a one of a person in hyperkalemia. First, let's look at the normal EKG. Okay, you have your P wave right here. It's nice, a big little hump. Then you have a little dip called the Q, and then you have a spike called the R, and then a dip called the S, and then an E, and then a little segment, and then a T wave. Notice how you have the prominent little R wave, then you have the PRS complex. It's nice and narrow, and then you have a medium-sized T wave. That is normal. Now, let's look over here. Okay, this is not normal. If you see this, this is funky. Okay, one thing is that you're going to have flat P waves. P waves start right here. Notice how this is nice and round. This right here, there is nothing there. It's pretty much flat. It's very low. Then you're gonna have a PR interval, which is prolonged. Notice, right here starts the PR interval, where I'm going up and down, and then it ends right here. Notice it's super short. There's like no lengthening. But here your P way, your PR interval would start here and then over here. And notice how long that is. That is super long. That's a prolonged PR interval. Not good at all. Then you can have QRS complex lengthening. It's widening. Notice how narrow this is over here. This one is not. It's very, very wide. Anything greater than 0.12 squares whenever you're measuring this out, seconds is too wide. Then you can also have the tall T wave. Notice how this T wave, it's a little bit, 
bumpy, nothing major, it's normal, but this T wave is tall, peaking up. It's peaking up almost where your QRS complex is. So that is absolutely abnormal. Now, one way to try to remember this, because I know it can get really confusing, hyper, everything's increased, it's it's big, it's, it's going all out. So remember the QRS complex, it's super wide, it's big, and your T wave is going to be really tall and really big. A lot of patients are gonna have that T wave. I've seen that a lot in the clinical setting. So just remember, it's just gonna be tall and exaggerated. Your PR interval is just going to be tall and exaggerated. Everything's hyper. And then your P wave, he's just a little bit flat and boring. So just try to remember that, especially the T wave. That's a really big exam question. Now let's take a look at the interventions. This is the part you definitely want to pay particular attention to because this is where a lot of test questions are gonna come from because you're gonna be given a scenario and you're gonna to need to know what to do for this patient with hyperkalemia as the nurse. And you need to know what's the doctor gonna order, what to be looking out for and things like that. Okay, so first, you want to monitor the patient's cardiac status, respiratory status, their neuro status, muscular status, and GI status. Because remember, potassium is responsible for nerve conduction and muscle conduction. And all these systems are gonna be affected. So put them on a cardiac monitor, an SpO2 monitor, things like that. Stop IV potassium infusions if the pa patient has them running or hold any PO supplements if they're getting those and call the doctor. Initiate a potassium restrictive diet. And a lot of times these tests will ask you, the patient's eating this, this, and this, which foods should they stop? And they're gonna test your knowledge. So you want to know what potassiums are rich in, I mean, what foods are rich in potassiums. And a clever way to remember that, have the word potassium written out. And P is for potatoes and pork. O is for oranges. T is for tomatoes. A is for avocados. S is for strawberries. The other S is for spinach. And then I, fish, use the I and the fish. And then U for mushrooms, the U and the mushrooms, you can put that there. And then M for muskmelon, which is a cantaloupe. And then as a side, there's carrots, raisins, and bananas. But those are the lot of the foods that questions are gonna ask and you need to know that those are potassium rich. And also for hypoclemia, you'll wanna know that as well because you'll want to actually encourage the patients to eat that. And next, you'll want to prepare the patient for dialysis. Again, a lot of these patients who are having hyperkalemia are dialysis renal patients, and going to dialysis will help relieve this. If not, if they've never had dialysis before, you'll probably start needing to prepare and educate them how that's going to take place. Um, another thing a doctor may order is called k exalate It can be given by mouth or an enema. The enema tends to be the most popular route, and it what it does is it causes GI, it, it enters the GI system and it causes sodium absorption, which will promote the excretion of potassium. Next, the doctor may order Lasix. Remember, Lasix is a potassium wasting drug. It'll cause them to urinate a lot and get rid of that potassium or other potassium wasting drugs, so make sure you know those. Um, another category is the thiazide, like hydrochlorothiazide. And of course, you would stop those um, sparing potassium drugs. And the doctor may order a hypertonic solution of glucose and insulin, regular insulin. And what this does is it will cause potassium to be pulled back into the cell. Because remember that cell drawing we had? What's happened is that normally potassium lives inside the cell and it's moved outside of the cell into the extracellular fluid. So giving this hypertonic solution will cause that potassium to go back into the cell, which is where we want it. Okay, so that is about hyperkalemia. Now I encourage you to go to my website, registerednursern.com and test your knowledge on this information. And thank you so much for watching and please be sure to check out my other teaching tutorials and consider subscribing to this YouTube channel.